Okay. For today's update, I had fully planned to talk about Ezekiel 38, uh, <laughs> which was really our other bookend of sorts, along with Psalm 83, which we looked at last week. However, for what I think would be deemed obvious reasons, uh, I would be grossly remiss were I not to address instead some significant and really even unprecedented developments from just the last 48 hours geopolitically. Uh, namely, this credible Al-Qaeda terrorist threat that has warranted the closing of all our U.S. embassies in all the Islamic countries for the first time in our nation's history. Then, in concert with this unprecedented closure of U.S. embassies, it seems that Secretary of State John Kerry has made significant headway with the so-called two-state solution, as it's called. Now, let me hasten to say, by way of a preface, that what I'm about to say is in no way meant to be perceived as provocative or sensational. Uh, actually, I prayed uh, this morning um, that the Lord would give me, uh, under the control of the Holy Spirit, self-control. <laughs> so that I wouldn't, you know, become that pulpit-pounding Palestinian passionate pastor. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> I am personally of the belief that something is about to happen. Something has to happen, and it will be the likes of which the world has never seen before. Now, when I say that, I'm not being arbitrary. The reason I say that and the reason I believe that is because that which is now on the table of Bible prophecy has a shelf life, as it were, or an expiration date, if you prefer. In other words, there are prophecies in play now that have this unstoppable momentum and as such, you cannot push the pause button on them. You cannot stop them. Just like birth pains, you cannot stop birth pains. It's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when and how soon. Now again, I can't overstate this enough. I, and I know I run the risk of sounding sensational and I'm trying to sort of play it down in the sense that uh, in the over 25 years that I've been studying Bible prophecy, I've personally never seen it like it is now. I have never seen that which we are witnessing right before our very eyes. Uh, perhaps you'll indulge me uh, for the remainder of our time in this prophecy update. I want to present the evidence and argue my case for why it is that I believe this may in fact be it. This may in fact be the final warning. I don't want to hype it up. I don't want to, you know, again, come off as, you know, being provocative, but I'm just going to simply uh, and even humbly present to you uh, why it is that I, with all of my heart, believe that we are at the end. You'll forgive my approaching this using courtroom lingo, but I'm going to enter in as Exhibit A the nine-month target date for a two-state solution, as it's called. Now, I see this as forensic evidence, if you will, of the sudden destruction that will come under the banner of 
Jews and Palestinians living side by side in, quote, peace and security, end quote. I would suggest that it's also evidence of what could arguably be the coming implosion decimating the United States of America, thus explaining her absence from the pages of Bible prophecy. If you're reading some of the same news reports that I'm reading, uh, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion amongst the experts, Christian and non-Christian, that it's just a matter of time, but the United States of America will cease as the world power, nay, even a world power on the global scene. Now, I find it rather ironic that the very nations who satanically, and it is satanic, and even secretly want to wipe Israel off the map will themselves be ultimately decimated and removed from the prophetic program, if you please. Last week, when one Arab Knesset member said, quote, we were here before you, speaking of the Arab people, my people, and we'll be here after you're gone. Benjamin Netanyahu, pictured here, was quick to respond, saying the following, quote, the first part is untrue, and the second won't come true. I love that guy. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, the pages of Holy Writ concur with the Prime Minister of Israel. I also find it ironic that Iran's president-elect Hassan Rouhani touted to be this moderate in his succession of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, would say on Friday that quote Israel was a foreign body that must be removed other sources quoted him as saying in Farsi Israel is a wound inflicted on the Muslim world that should be removed. <laughs> now, as you might imagine, this prompted uh, calls for clarification. And the clarification did come, but it came by way of an attempt to blame the translation for misquoting what he, in fact, said. Now, I'm not that stupid, <laughs> and neither are you, and neither is Benjamin Netanyahu, who in response to this stated that Rouhani's true face has been revealed earlier than expected, and that the president there has changed, but the goal of the regime has not Joel Rosenberg, one of my favorites, big fan of his, was on Fox News this morning and in response to this said the following, I thought it was just so aptly uh, said uh, with regards to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and Hassan Rouhani. He said, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was a wolf in wolf's clothing. Uh, this uh, new president, Hassan Rouhani, is a wolf in sheep's clothing because he's supposedly this softer, moderate uh, face, but the fact of the matter is you take the mask off and what you find is the same wolf. And really, it doesn't matter who the president of Iran is because no matter who the president is, they will always be a puppet on the strings of the hands of the Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, by the way, parenthetically, let me say that the timing today is also ironic as well. And here's why. Uh, today just so happens to be President Obama's birthday. Uh, today 
in Iran, Hassan Rouhani was officially sworn in as Iran's new president. Today, we closed all our embassies for the first time in history in not Christian countries, but Islamic countries. And it just so happens to coincide with the day that the Muslims during Ramadan celebrate as the day of power. It is a high holy day, if you will, and it just so happens to be on this day that all of this falls on. Uh, I'm going to leave it there because uh, if I don't, I will be accused, as I often am, of being a conspiracy wacko. And, uh, <laughs> which, you know, if the shoe fits, but, you know, some of these conspiracies are no conspiracies at all. They're facts, they're agendas, and there's a difference between a conspiracy and an agenda, a satanic one at that. Okay, this brings us to Exhibit B, which is the conspicuous timing of specific signs in the sun and the moon correlating with the Jewish feasts. Uh, for those of you who were with us on our Thursday night uh, Bible study when we were going through the book of Leviticus, we did an in-depth study of the Jewish feasts, all seven of them, and the prophetic significance of them in chapter 23. You can actually go online and uh, study those uh, from those uh, teachings, but very significant uh, in the sense that the Jewish feasts point to the person of Jesus Christ, all seven of them. The first three were fulfilled in Jesus Christ's first coming with the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits. This was a picture of a prophecy pointing to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So all of these feasts, which interesting in the original language of the Hebrew, the word for feast or festival is the same as it is in my native tongue of Arabic. It's the Arabic and Hebrew word mu'ad, which means an appointment or that which points to an appointed time, which is very interesting in the sense that all of these feasts, mu'ad, if you will, point to the fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, wouldn't you know that these prior uh, blood moons would take place on these Jewish festivals, these Jewish holy days, significantly 1948 when they were reborn as a nation. 1967, when they recaptured their eternal capital, Jerusalem. So you can trace back prior heretofore and see how these blood moons would take place during these high holy days in Israel when they're celebrating these feasts, these festivals. And here's the thing, Every single time something significant happened in Israel, to Israel, against Israel, and or with Israel in conjunction with those blood moons. And that's what makes this so fascinating. Now, we're not going to take the time in the interest of time today to go into depth into the significance of it, uh, but for those of you who would wish to research it, as I am uh, even now doing, you can find a number of watchers, as I'll call them online, who have done just a fabulous uh, study of it, very thorough and uh, documented, and you might want to, uh, in your own study of God's Word, uh, search this out and uh, see the significance of it. Now, I bring that into the discussion and submit it as evidence, 
uh, exhibit B because it's so compelling in that there's meteorological evidence that will be visible in terms of the effects that will be coming upon the earth in concert with these blood moons. We know all too well here in Hawaii, don't we, how the moon affects the tide and uh, with it those demon-possessed man of wars and you know box jellyfish <laughs> based on the full moon ten days later. I didn't learn that until my son right when we first moved here at Kalamas of all place, places was stung by a box jellyfish and and it, as it turns out he um, is allergic to box jellyfish stings and he went into anaphylaxis shock and I rushed him to the hospital and he swelled up like a puffer fish and it just scared me you know but anyway that's why I think they're demon possessed and they won't be in heaven just so you know <laughs> be that as it may we're already seeing these signs and we're seeing what is manifested because of them never seen before earthquakes and tsunamis that ensue and with them they strike fear whenever they issue a warning consider the words of the Savior it's recorded in Luke's gospel the 21st chapter in verses 25 and 26 where he says there will be signs in the sun in the moon and in the stars and on the earth listen distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring that's a tsunami <laughs> men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for, listen, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This is a description from the Savior himself prophetically of that which is about to come to pass at the time of the end and I would submit that it is even now coming to pass in real time right before our very eyes. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but two weeks ago we narrowly missed a massive solar flare and barely avoided a disaster. And by disaster, what I'm speaking of is what's known as an EMP, which is the acronym for an electromagnetic pulse, which would have been catastrophic globally. Experts fear this more than just about anything else by virtue of how an EMP could render in part or whole the entire world's power grid utterly useless. Which is interesting because in Ezekiel 38 we're told that they have uh, primitive weaponry even so much that they're writing on horses so it could very well be plausible that something does happen by way of this EMP and by the way in the book of Revelation during the tribulation uh, the solar flares the Sun will literally scorch people and burn them alive that's during the seven-year tribulation Last Wednesday, July 31st, the Washington Examiner reported on this near miss with the headline reading, Massive Solar Flare Narrowly Misses Earth, EMP Disaster Barely Avoided. Uh, let me just uh, read for you a couple of very scary uh, excerpts <laughs> from this report. Uh, what an what a update today, huh? Depressing and, and scary. That's in Jesus' name. <laughs> <clears throat> quote the earth barely missed taking a massive solar punch in the teeth two weeks ago an electromagnetic pulse so big that it could have knocked out power cars and iPhones not iPhones <laughs> throughout the entire United States the article goes on to talk about how that 
they have been after this administration to make preparation for one of these events and thus far have only been given the cold shoulder. Time doesn't permit, at least for today anyway, to enter in more evidence such as the prophecies that for the last several months we've been looking at, right? I mean, they all come into play. They all intersect one with the other. They're all coming to pass in concert one with the other. But suffice it to say, and I think you would agree, the preponderance of the evidence is such that one would have to conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that this is it and that something is about to happen. Have you ever had that feeling that something's got to give? It cannot continue on the way it is. Something's got to give, man. And there's just that sense, really a discernment in your spirit that something's about to happen. I suppose you could say the jury's no longer out and as such the verdict is in and the judge of the universe is about to meet out judgment in this the courtroom of eternity I want to say this very calmly very honestly very humbly and very lovingly judgment is coming judgment is coming justly and righteously so and if you're not right with Jesus Christ, you will be subjected to the wrath of God, the judgment of God on this Christ-rejecting world. God is going to judge this world. And the basis upon which He judges this world will be solely on the person of Jesus Christ and what you and I have done about the person of Jesus Christ. Is He your Lord and Savior today? If He is, then this is exciting. If He's not your Lord and Savior today, then this is terrifying, is it not? But it's a healthy fear. It's the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. It's the fear of the Lord that the Proverbs says is to hate evil. This world is evil. I know when I say this, I speak on behalf of many here today, but uh, there's this sense that we've overstayed our welcome in this fallen, evil world as it waxes more evil, seemingly, by the day. This is not our home. Soon and very soon that trumpet is going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise and we who are alive and remain will meet them in the air and will put off corruptible, put on incorruptible. In other words, we're going to get our new glorified bodies, which uh, I can't wait for. <laughs> this one's got a lot of miles on it. And forever will be with the Lord. Now I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but... Before I bring today's prophecy update to a close, I think it's incumbent upon me to reiterate two things. Again, by way of a preface. First, I can't overstate it. Please, this is not meant to be perceived as hypersensational or dramatic or alarmist. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, I in no way want what I'm about to say to be perceived as date setting. I'm only going to submit it sort of as further evidence, but also I'm going to suggest it. And I'm also with that going to package with it the exhortation to be a Berean yourself and search the scriptures yourself and see if this be so but there's something here that the Lord just really opened my eyes to and I want to share it with you it's really quite interesting 
I find it peculiar how that Secretary of State John Kerry would state that the goal of reaching a comprehensive peace agreement would be within nine months. Not eight months, not ten months, nine months. Now, here's why I find it peculiar. I find it peculiar for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that in nine months, the first of the four blood moons will take place in Israel and it will happen on April 15th of 2014 which just so happens to be the feast of Passover and it just so happens to be within nine months another reason that I find peculiar a nine-month goal of Jews and Palestinians living side by side in peace and security is because of how the Apostle Paul says what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Thessalonica recorded in his first epistle the fifth chapter verse 3 two updates ago we did an entire prophecy update on uh, this particular and specific prophecy so I know you're familiar with it but I want to point out something in it that is not easily seen at first read the Apostle Paul writes in the context of the rapture he says while people are saying two words specific words peace and security destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape the first thing I want to point out is this distinction between we and they because Paul will go on to say that we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air when the dead in Christ rise first at the sound of the trumpet but the second thing I want to point out is this uh, analogy of a woman in labor, a pregnant woman in labor. Here's what I'm thinking. The analogy of a pregnant woman suddenly going into labor after being pregnant for not eight months, not ten months, but nine months. Oh, pastor, you're reading too much into it. Fine. <laughs> Guilty as charged. But to me, I don't think it's a coincidence. And I base that on the presupposition that God does not want His people ignorant concerning last day's prophecies. He wants us watching. He wants us ready so that when it comes, it will not be for us as a thief in the night. Now let me take it a step further, if you don't mind. If this goal is achieved within that nine-month window, and it very well could be, then it may also stand to reason that this may in fact be the final warning. Now here's how I get there just as there's no warning prior to the actual labor pains before the labor pains come on there may also be no warnings prior to the sudden destruction in which we escape but they do not escape well, what are you saying well I think I've shared this with you before and I'm becoming increasingly more convinced especially on the heels of what's happened just in the last 48, 72 hours, I'm becoming increasingly more convinced that this sudden destruction that comes upon them as a pregnant woman in labor, and it's such that they do not escape, may very well be when the rapture happens. What? No, stay with me. 
this sudden destruction comes while they're saying peace and security and even now under the banner of this so-called two-state solution they're saying those exact two words peace and security while they're saying it sudden destruction comes and this is where that distinction that the Apostle Paul makes comes in they will not escape that would seemingly indicate that we escape are we not encouraged in scripture that we will be the ones that will escape the judgment that's coming it's actually for this reason that many of our well-intentioned uh, Christian brothers and sisters uh, give us such a hard time about our pre-tribulation rapture belief you know they uh, you know tell us well you just want to escape to which I usually respond lovingly of course as a pastor ya think you don't that's another topic for another time but again in closing uh, the evidence examine the evidence forensically biblically and see if this is not so because Jesus said I come at an hour you expect not it will be as a thief in the night there's no warnings this is, this is another analogy in, in, with, in tandem with the uh, labor pains of a pregnant woman analogy there's no warning prior to the thief coming in the night you'll, you'll never have a thief call you at midnight and say hey uh, I'm a thief and I just wanted to warn you that I'm going to be coming uh, and breaking in at 2 a.m. I just wanted to warn you and I'm going to you know break in and steal uh, from you click I know that's silly <laughs> it's a gift I have the gift of silliness but I think you get the point right all that to say is this the final warning maybe it is has the nine months commenced? It may have. Is the sudden destruction coming? And with it, the rapture? I believe so. With all my heart. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're ever so thankful to you for your word and the more sure word of prophecy. Lord, I pray that for those of us who may be weary in well-doing, discouraged, grieved, at where this nation is going and where this world is going, that this today might be for us a word fitly spoken, an encouragement to us to look up and lift up our heads knowing that as we see these things begin to come to pass that our redemption draws nigh. And Lord, for those who do not know you and don't have that assurance of salvation found only in you, that today would be the day of their salvation that they would see that you've told us what's going to happen before it happens so when it happens they would believe that now is the time delay no more don't take the chance choose you this day whom you will serve Lord thank you in Jesus' name, amen.